got mail. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome to the Everything 80s podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out to part two of my podcast mini series called From Dial Up to Satellites, where we look at the early history of the internet. In the first part, if you haven't heard that already, you can go back one episode where we look at the origins of the World Wide Web the early days of the internet, and then how important Netscape was to bring the internet to the world. Now we're looking at how it got into everybody's homes. What was the main platform that really made it accessible to everyone? And that's going to be the rise and growth of America Online, or AOL. But before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. I should be there. Okay, here we go. So this whole story is as much part internet and technology and part marketing. And the rise of AOL, which turned it into a powerhouse in the internet days, is really also one of the best marketing campaigns in consumer history. So of course, if you listen to the first episode, the intro, I included the horrific dial-up modem getting online sound. And if you recognize that sound, you know what era you came from. If that was brand new to you, this is how the internet worked. We used to get it through phone lines. And it seems like looking back now, it seems as archaic as rubbing two sticks together to make fire for the way we got online. But in the early days of home internet, it was this one company that dominated the entire industry, AOL. Again, depending on your age, you may remember those AOL discs showing up everywhere in your mailbox, in magazines, being handed out at sporting events, to variety stores, like just everywhere you look, there were AOL discs. Again, if this is all new to you, I'll explain what was happening. The reason that these discs were everywhere, because this was one of the most effective marketing campaigns ever done. And there was one woman really who took this whole approach and honestly brought the internet to North America. And as much as, you know, we joke about Al Gore inventing the internet, we know if you listen to episode one, it was a guy named Tim Berners-Lee who put all the pieces together of what was already existing technology-wise and then creating what the internet would become. And then uh, Mark Andreessen, who helped found Netscape, is what allowed people to now browse it properly. And he created the first browser in Netscape. But if you're looking at how it really became a mass consume platform, it's because of this woman named Jan Brandt. So she started out in educational publishing and insurance sales. She then became vice president of marketing for AOL in 1993. So this is how quick the internet is growing. So again, if you listen to the first episode, You know, in 1989 is when Tim Berners-Lee put together the proposal that would become the internet. And then it really launched in around 1990. By the end of 90, or no, mid-92 is when Netscape um, launched. There was a bunch of other browsers, browsers, but this is how quick the web is growing. AOL goes all the way back to 1993. We're only a few years into the decade. Do you remember the first time you went online? I remember it specifically. My high school, again, I'm showing my age here, but I'm hosting a podcast all about the 80s, so it's probably pretty clear. My high school had one computer that had internet access, and you were only allowed to use it for like 15-minute blocks at a time because it was not only slow, but it was still really expensive. No one really knew what they were doing on it. And I remember coming back after uh, sports practice of some sort and seeing the computer lab was open and was with a friend and they had used the computer and they knew how to get on the internet. I had no idea. So we finally got on it. The only thing, that, that was the thing, what do you do once you get on it? The only websites I had ever heard of were 
tsn.ca, which is a Canadian sports company, and then toystory.com. That was right when Toy Story was coming out, and they were using one of the very first big websites to promote the movie. So that was the only thing I knew. Like, there was no Google. You didn't know what to navigate. You could only, like, search these sites, and those are the only things I'd ever heard of. So we went to try it. So maybe you remember your specific memory. So the internet is brand new to people. And even at this time, 1993, it's such a long time ago, the, even the concept of having a computer in your home was still somewhat foreign. What would you do with this thing besides play games on it? And why would anyone need to go online? So Jan Brandt had this enormous job to grow the AOL user base and increase the company and increase the users in a time where people still didn't really know what the benefits of a computer were. The company was in the tough position of either giving in or being acquired by Bill Gates. They were being really hounded by Microsoft and Bill Gates, who was still, it's funny enough, was still not sold on the internet. It took him a while to come around, but he knew he just wanted to absorb every company possible. Anyone that had any perspective of being successful, he wanted to take over it. So they could either give in, be acquired by Bill Gates, or try to go toe-to-toe with them. Going toe-to-toe would turn out to be the smart move. There were several internet providers out there. This is what AOL is. It's an internet provider. It's giving you access to everything. You're paying to use the internet through America Online. So they're not the only game in town. So the big decision Brandt made was not to promote why theirs was better but this was the billion dollar idea. It was to educate people on why they needed to be online. So a lot of the information I got for this series is from this amazing book called How the Internet Happened by Brian McCullough. And Brandt's talking about the early focus groups for America online. So they're trying to, you know, share why the internet is beneficial. Like I said, that first time I went into it in my high school computer lab, I knew of it. I knew these two websites you could go to, I didn't know anything beyond that. And I am reasonably technologically advanced. Um, So for the average person, what are they going to do with this? So the problem is in these focus groups, people in the groups barely knew what a computer could do, let alone what going online was. She would talk about how the participants would pick up a mouse and move it in the air to try and control the machine. I'm like doing that right now as I'm describing this. Others would place the mouse on the ground and try to use it like the pedal on a sewing machine. Now they realize how much work they've got cut out for them. Like just explaining the computer is hard enough, let alone explaining what the internet was. This is why this is a fascinating story of how this company actually grew when it probably shouldn't. So it all comes down to getting into people's homes. AOL had put together a really great service. Again, I don't know if you ever used it, but it was extremely user-friendly in a time where that wasn't a real term and people didn't know how hard things could actually be if you're working online. It was so much more user-friendly than the other internet service providers who, again, catered more to technological internet people where AOL was trying to, you know, get to that average person. Like, Um, Mark Andreessen said, who created Netscape, if the internet was to be successful, they had to let the riffraff in. That's how it was going to grow. And AOL was all about that, making it very pedestrian, very simple, very straightforward, nice colors, really clean, like all big successful companies online, you know, Google, Facebook, it's all about simplicity and that cleanliness of appearance and userness. So What AOL did in making it more user-friendly is they used those modern and pleasant graphics and colors. You could send pictures. And the one big thing they did that changed the trajectory of the World Wide Web was their focus was on interaction and being able to chat to other people. And this is a whole side note, which we'll cover a bit later on. AOL inadvertently created social networking and they just didn't know it. If you remember um, AIM and online chats, 
and putting that all together, they really created what social networking would become and had millions of users and was transforming how people interacted, but they had no idea. Fair enough, though, because that hadn't really existed. And it wasn't until Friendster and MySpace and inevitably Facebook that people would realize how powerful this was. So not totally their fault, but it's crazy when you go back and look at especially AIM and how AOL worked, what they had on their hands and just didn't take advantage of. So AOL is putting all their focus on interaction and communication and networking with people and your friends. So now, besides that, you could also go online and search for anything you wanted. People didn't realize this at first. You could also go email your friends. You could send them messages in real time. You could send notes to family members from the other side of the world. You could chat with them in real time. Again, stuff that's so common today, but really mind-blowing. Common now, but revolutionary back in 1993. And the big thing is AOL made it fun to do. That's what I remember specifically. It took a while before my specific house went online, but I remember getting the disc, which we'll talk about in a second. The one amazing thing was you didn't have to be online to use it you could still like interact and go through it and you could actually like hook up another computer in your house with the same disc and still use the chat function between each other and again mind-blowing all without having to be on the internet like amazing software and revolutionary for the time so the product's ready but now they have to get it into people's homes this way, AOL would sell itself, and it really did. If, if you remember using it, like it completely sold itself. It was simple to use. There was no downloading through a website. You didn't have to connect it you know, via Wi-Fi. This is a time where AOL had to physically be installed with a disk. So that's another barrier to entry, where now anything that has to be installed is one click or a swipe or a finger press or whatever. This had physical installation needed. So Jan Brandt had a background in direct mail campaigns, and she came up with the idea to just give the product away for free. This is astonishing and a massive risk for an upstart company. AOL would spend $250,000 to mass produce a ton of trial discs. Starting in the spring of 1993, AOL would send out the free disc wherever they could. And that's probably when you remember seeing them everywhere, piled up everywhere, (laughs) everywhere you went, someone handed you an AOL disc. But the success was immediate. The response rate to this campaign was 10%. So I don't know if you know anything about direct marketing or have ever heard of it, but this is considered astronomically successful. This 10% was people who took the free disc, installed it on their computer, found out how great it was, grabbed their credit card, and signed up for the full version. This had never really happened before. The consumer was doing all the work. That's, of course, when you have an exceptional product, which AOL did. So now they grow the campaign. The 10% response rate was just the start. Brant went all in on the marketing. The goal was to get an AOL disc into every home in America. Computers now were becoming more commonplace in people's homes, and AOL wanted to be ubiquitous with the home computer. AOL continued to send their discs in the mail, and that's when people started using them for either coasters or, you know, how many discs did you really need? But they didn't care. They wanted to put them anywhere people were. The whole concept of the World Wide Web was pretty mind-blowing now to people. They were starting to get it, and AOL was the gateway to it. So like I said, the invention of the internet's obviously massive. Netscape is the way that you're going to navigate around it, but it really is AOL that brought the internet to the world. And AOL didn't stop there, though. Besides all those mailings, Discs were now given away with movie rentals. If you remember Blockbuster always doing that, they put them in newspapers, they put them in magazines, they, you know, handing them out before sporting events. Um, they, they even started to test freeze the discs to see if they could be given away with Omaha steaks. That's how 
thorough they wanted to be. I remember personally walking into Walmarts and seeing AOL discs all over the floor by the magazines racks. You know, people would just pick up magazines and start browsing through them and the discs would just fall out and just, they'd pile up all over the ground. For more than half of the 90s, AOL spent over $300 million just on this marketing campaign. They called this carpet bombing, just flooding the market. $300 million converted for today is upwards of six six $620 million, which is incredible. The production was so big on these discs that at this point in the mid-90s, half of all CDs produced in the world had the AOL logo on them. So how did this pay- campaign pay off? Obviously pretty well. And it's the reason you've heard of AOL and not other ISPs from the time, such as Prodigy, for example. Here's a, another side note. If you've never heard of or haven't seen the series called Halt and Catch Fire, and you're remotely interested in computers, the internet, the era of the 80s and 90s and growth of all this stuff, definitely watch this. This is one of the most underrated, unknown shows you'll ever see. Nobody knows this thing. Again, I saw it on Netflix. Series bounce around all the time. It came out years ago. And it really is about the early days of the computers, but not a focus on Silicon Valley, where everyone thinks it is. It was about what was going on in Texas. And it's a fictional story, but it's all based in reality. And we're seeing a fictional version of CompuServe and then the growth of the first web browsers. And when I mentioned that other um, internet service provider called Prodigy, we see them do their version of that. And it's just, it's an amazing look into this era and how it all developed. And it, you know, it it is, it's a, it's still a drama. It is, it's Mad Men-ish. I'd say it's a little derivative of Mad Men. There's scenes where they're obviously trying to copy Mad Men, not surprisingly, because it's one of the greatest shows ever. So there's a lot of boardroom scenes and they have a guy who's supposed to be their Don Draper and everything like that doing his big presentations. But if you can ever, it's called Halt and Catch Fire, which is an instructional code, I think, which would automatically like shut down a computer or terminate it like a self destruct sort of thing. I, yeah, check uh, the last when I saw it, it was on Netflix. I'm not sure where it is right now, but again, amazing insight to this era and this growth of the computer internet industry. So the marketing campaign is working, but before Brandt's uh, campaign took off, AOL had around 500,000 members. After the campaign, when all those discs went out, they were signing up 70,000 new users a month. By August of 1994, they passed a million members. This is just like barely a year later. New subscribers were being logged in every six seconds. That's how fast it was going. The company had tripled in size in just one year. Then they doubled just six months later. By By May 1996, they were at 5 million subscribers. I looked up some more information from this time, and the co-founder of AOL named Steve Case did a question and answer session on Quora, and he discussed this early marketing campaign. So he says how their goal was to spend 10% of a consumer's lifetime revenue to get a new subscriber. The average AOL customer was signing on for 25 months, spending around $350. AOL would therefore spend $35 on the disc to acquire them. Then, as the price of the disc went down, they were able to ramp up their marketing. One example, and you heard it right before the intro music, is the delightful movie You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. In one of the most flagrant uses of product placement ever seen in a movie, the deal involved millions of dollars to feature AOL as the centerpiece of the Nora Ephron project. And... I love this movie. I won't lie. I've seen it a ton. I've been to a bunch of the places that were featured in the movie in New York. And it's based on a book called Shop Around the Corner, I believe. And it basically just took that story and put it into, um, instead of these two lovers or whatever, they're sharing you know messages by notes and not knowing who the other one is, they bring it into you know, the modern era and they do it through email and instant messaging. And AOL is the cornerstone of this movie. And again, 
it's as product placement as product placement goes, but it's just so charming. You can't even be mad at this giant collaboration between America Online and Warner Brothers. So Case goes on to share some more information. He said that when they went public in 1992, they had just 200,000 subscribers. One decade later, it was 25 million. He says how this drove up their market capitalization from 70 million when they had their first uh, IPO after that was launched to the point where they combined with Time Warner, they were worth $150 billion. It just like mind boggling numbers that happen with this company. So, I mean, it looks like it wasn't just Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks's characters that struck, struck up a, a big romance because of that film. It set in stage this massive merger, the biggest merger of all time, which didn't end up well for Time Warner AOL, but it was the dominant era of internet and traditional media coming together all because of, of AOL. So it's pretty crazy to look back because everyone thought Jan Brandt was nuts to give away the product for free. No one had ever done anything like that, especially in an era where the internet was brand new. There was no idea if this thing was going to last or not. And these startup companies uh, like are barely hanging on. They've got razor thin margins. They're trying to raise money and capital and then they give their product away for free. Like the, only an established giant company could do that. It was one of the biggest risks in modern consumer history and it worked. She had the foresight to not only see how the internet was changing the world, but how it was impacting people on a personal level. And that's the big thing with America Online. They made it personal where all the other internet service providers or browsers were again a little industrial, a little mechanical, bland. AOL made it fun just with that, you know, when you'd log on and you'd see that little mailbox flag thing go up and then you'd hear the you've got mail. They made it fun and they made it personal. Again, Brandt also knew how good their product was because of all these features. She knew once it got into people's hands, they would love it. And personally, I remember feeling the exact same way the first time I used AOL. as like, oh, I get it. This is cool. This is fun. What's interesting too is she took a common marketing practice. I mentioned this direct mail thing, this old timey thing that had been used for decades and then used it to promote a new modern technology. It's this astonishing story of old meets new. And it's, again, the story of AOL is all about this woman, Jan Brandt, and the amazing example of having the vision to combine two different worlds that no one saw possible, connecting that direct mail marketing and this brand new internet and turn it into a massive success. So I'll finish it there. That's the end of part two. As we go into part three, we're going to talk about now how the internet's changing and how the idea of search is what takes the internet to the next level. Everyone's now using it. They know how fun it is. But how does it organize together? And that's all going to do with the search company, with the very funny name that made the internet absolutely go through the roof. So that'll be coming up soon. Make sure you subscribe so you get it and don't miss out. Thank you for listening to this. And I'll just finish off. If you're interested in supporting a show, this sounds like a PBS pledge drive, but if you're interested in, in supporting smaller shows like this, there is a platform called patreon.com where for like a small monthly donation, you support the show, but then you get bonus audio content for doing so. So in my case, if you subscribe at the Boba Fett level, you get access to the Everything 80s Movie Club where I review the good, the bad, and the ugly of 1980s movies. And I've got one coming up in the next week or two. The regular podcast I release like clockwork every Wednesday. The Everything 80s Movie Club on Patreon, I drop them out of nowhere, so you'll never know when they're coming. But in the next week or two, I've I've been reviewing a lot of the good lately. This is going to be a review of the bad, the very bad. And I'll give you one hint for it, Cherry Bomb. Sometimes I think the hints I give are too obvious. I don't think this one is, but that's that's the hint for the next one coming up. So if you want to learn more about that, support the show and support small independent shows like this, you go to patreon.com slash 80s. So P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash 80s. Or wherever you're listening, there should be a link to go there. So either way, thank you for taking the time to listen to this show and I will talk to you soon.